Name Tag Sunday is one of my favorite days as well, just because <laughs> it, it's just special when you're a part of a family, when you're a part of a body, to come together, to support one another, to love one another. You, you look through the epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, throughout the scriptures you see how we're called to love one another and this visible uh, representation of people committing themselves to Christ and committing themselves to one another. It's an opportunity for us to be able to support one another when we go through the highs and the lows, the valleys of the shadows of death and the, the, the heights of, of glory. <laughs> that we're here to support one another, encourage one another, exhort one another in love. And for us to be a part of that as a body, as a community, that we not only share at the table together, but we also celebrate when new members, when new family members come in to the community. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this day. We thank you for this first Sunday of Lent. And as Katie said, Lord, may we lay down those things that are lifeless, that are empty, so that we can pick up that which is of greatest substance as we receive you, Holy Spirit, into our lives once again. Reinvigorate us and reinvigorate our faith in you, Jesus. We pray that you give us faith to have faith. We trust in you. We lean into you in all things. And God, we pray that during this season that you will move in a powerful way. We bring to you not only our lives today, but we bring to you our lives throughout this Lenten season. May you be lifted up, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Some of you all know that uh, I have five daughters. And... Uh, Hundreds and hundreds of times people have come up to me and they say, hey, do, you, uh, do you own a shotgun yet? Because what, what you should do is, is that when the boyfriends come over, when the dates come over, you need to polish off that thing, you need to carry it around, and you wait for the doorbell to get rung, and then you go to the door and you greet the, the boyfriend or the prom date or the homecoming date, and you got that shotgun on the side because that's what you do to intimidate them. And there, there's two observations in that. The first is I don't own a shotgun. <laughs> uh, I own a Nerf gun. <laughs> But I don't, I don't think that that'll have the same impact or effect. I do, I do have a fly fishing rod, uh, but again, I don't think that'll do, have the same impact as a shotgun. But I, I found another more powerful thing to do to intimidate my daughter's dates. And I, and I told my oldest one this when she was going off to her homecoming. I said, well, I want to meet this dude. I want to find out what this guy is all about. And I'm going to ask him two questions. I'm going to say, what's your uh, favorite Bible verse? <laughs> and then I want to find out what is the Lord doing in your life? And it strikes terror in my daughters, <laughs> absolutely, because one, they know I won't pull out a shotgun, but they, they, they do know that I'll ask those two questions. And the person that's dating my daughters also know that I'm a pastor, so I have a right to those questions. <laughs> now, the reason why that may strike, strike a little bit of uh, terror in the, the, the heart of the boyfriend is this, is because he may say to himself, what does dating your daughter or going to homecoming or prom with your daughter have anything to do with my favorite Bible verse? It seems like those two things are very separate. Like, what, what does a relationship with Jesus have to do with dating your daughter? To which I would say, it makes all the difference in the world. Because in our society, what Charles Taylor says is that we live in a disenchanted world. That society says this, that, that there is a buffer between God and and humanity. That's what society thinks. That's what our culture thinks. And so that God doesn't break through. We don't live in a porous world in which God's presence comes down and is intimate in every area of our life, that God becomes personal. Society doesn't believe that. Society doesn't believe that we, we live in an enchanted world. That we, it doesn't believe that we live in a, in a charged world with God's presence, his grandeur, his glory, his presence. What they say is, is that God's distant. I'm down here. So how God's presence has impact in my dating life or uh, how I make decisions, uh, when I lose my keys, or how I just de determine what kind of job I should take, where I should go on vacation, what I should do with my life. In terms of those sorts of things, God's distant because there's this secular, sacred divide here, and God doesn't break through in those, those kinds of decisions. And so a boyfriend may say, what does my favorite Bible passage had to do with dating your daughter, which I would say it makes all the difference in the world because we don't di live in a disenchanted world. We live in an enchanted world where things are not buffered but porous and all of creation is charged with the glory of God. So it makes every difference when you date my daughter. What's your favorite Bible verse? <laughs> yes. Tell me what the Lord is doing in your life. I want to know if you're going to date my daughter. 
But we do. We live in a society that's disenchanted, that does not believe that God's presence makes every dif- difference in our world. And I want to I push back a little bit on that. I want to push back. Because we believe that creation is charged with God's glory. And Jesus would say this, that we are called to abide in him, and apart from him, we can do nothing. Now, the image here is abiding as the branch abides in the vine. And so you can't have different parts of the branch abiding without other parts abiding. Because as soon as a part of the branch ceases to abide in the fullness of the vine, that part of the branch begins to die. And so also, as soon as we segment our life out and say, this part I'm going to give to God, but this part I'm not going to give to God. As soon as we say, this part I'm not going to give to God, and we may not say that uh, explicitly, but we implicitly believe it within our hearts. And as soon as we do that, there's a part of our hearts that begins to die because we cease to abide in the vine. Jesus would also say this, you're going to do greater works than me. Now, when I woke up this morning, I didn't think to myself, I'm about to go do greater works than Jesus. Because I know myself, I know my heart is fickle. I know my limitations, I know what I can and cannot do. And when I hear those promises in God's word, it says, you're gonna do greater works than Jesus. There's a part of us that says, well, no, not really. You gotta understand something about what Jesus is really saying. There's something within us that becomes to get cynical and skeptical about God's works, God's ways breaking into our life. And when we read passages like that, we just kind of skip over it. We say, not my life. I mean, I've never met one person who'll say, how are you doing? I've never heard somebody say, well, I'm just doing greater works than Jesus. <laughs> you know how he raised the dead? I saw five people raised. I, I, raised, I fed 10,000 people, not just 5,000 people. Never heard anybody say that. Now, somebody may say, well, what Jesus is talking about is the church. He's talking about the church overall. That's fair. But I've never talked to a pastor. How's your church going, pastor? I've never heard a pastor say, yeah, we're just doing greater works than Jesus. Wow. That's what's going on in our church. You know that Jesus was doing all those great things. Our church is doing even greater things than that. And so we justify it away. And and there's something within our hearts to become skeptical when we read those promises. And as soon as we become skeptical and cynical about the promises of God, about the words of God, about the ways of God, about the works of God, there's something within us that begins to die. In other words, there's something within us that turns to dust. Because if you look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, what's the difference between dust and the creation of man? God's presence. There was dust, and as soon as the Spirit came, the dust became a human being. In the New Testament, what's the difference between somebody who's spiritually alive and spiritually dead? Presence of God. What's the difference between dust and life? It's God's presence, God's Spirit. And I'll I'll say this, sisters and brothers, God's Spirit is here. And his presence here makes all the difference in the world. Because without his presence, we're dust. And to dust, we shall return. And he's given us an invitation during this Lenten season to come out of dust and into his spirit-filled life. And there's something that happens within all of us when we begin to hear us. I'm not sure that that's true because there's a temptation at the root of that question. There's a temptation within our hearts to say, is that really true? Is that really possible? There's a temptation that begins to get spoken into our life that says, is it possible that we as a church can do greater works than Christ? Is it possible that we as a church can live that spirit filled? Is that possible? And then we begin to shift over into not a porous life, but a buffered life. Why is that temptation there? And we see that in Genesis chapter 3. We see what the temptation is. And it, it didn't begin with us. It began with our first parents. And when the temptation was given to them, something unique was being spoken by Satan to our first parents. And they took that temptation hook, like, hook, line, and sinker. And as a result, that temptation has been with us ever since. So what is the temptation that draws us into skepticism? If you have your scriptures, we're going to be looking at two different passages. One is in Mark, but the other, first one is in Genesis chapter 3. And it's found in verse 1. And here's the temptation. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than all the other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree of the garden? Did God really say? Now, all the commentators are, are, agree on this, is that what Satan is doing, he's attacking two things. Not only the attitude of the heart, but he's also attacking the truth of the mind. But first, he's attacking the attitude of the heart. Did God really say? In other words, it's cynicism. Can you believe what God said? Notice he's not attacking 
the presence of God. He's not coming against the existence of God. Heck no, most of the world believes in the existence of God, and this world is still a mess. He's not coming against the existence of God. He's not even going against the holiness of God. He's going, he's going against the word of God being credible. Can you believe this is what God said? Did indeed? Can you believe it? That this is what God says? This is laughable, is what he's coming at us with. And Adam and Eve took it. What he's tempting us with is a heart of cynicism, that God is present and that God is good. That God is present and God is good. Did God really say these things? Is that possible? Can you believe that? Indeed, that's laughable. And it finds its way in the human heart. And as soon as we believe that, we can't trust in the goodness and the good presence of God's goodness for our life. You know, it's interesting. Eric Erickson, developmental psychologist, is one of the most quoted psychologists. And he, he, he focused on uh, development, human development, but, but especially during the early ages. And he says something interesting. He says, if in the early ages of a child, if they don't understand or learn how to trust a healthy parent, then as they go out into the rest of their life, there will be an inability or a handicap to be able to trust in all other relationships. Why? Because with their parent in the early ages, they were never able to trust. And I find it interesting that at the beginning of human history, our first parents were tempted not to trust the goodness of God. And that virus has been unleashed to every person and every generation since. You can't trust him. You can't trust the goodness of God. You gotta take matters into your own hands. You look at his promises. Are those good? Can we trust them? No, we've got we, we, we to we control things for ourselves. You can't trust them. And that word of cynicism or skepticism has found its way into our heart. So if there's a temptation within us, thinking about God, and what takes us to the place of dust, it's that temptation that we can't trust them. It's the attitude of cynicism. And I tell you what, cynicism is so popular in our day and age because it has a sense of, elitism. If I'm cynical, then I'm cultured. If I'm cynical, I'm in the know. And I'm able to punch holes at everybody else's argument. I'm able to look through what everybody else is saying. I can critique everyone and everything, but never offer a solution myself. So I kind of stand back as the Monday morning armchair quarterback evaluating everybody else, everything else, but not offering a hope of solution or redemption. And that's why cynicism is irredeemable. Because cynicism pokes holes at everything else without having the humility to offer up a solution or the courage to step in it. Cynicism is so deadly. One, uh, an author who um, since taken his life a popular American writer, David um, Foster Wallace, says this. He critiques. Now, there, there, there's a um, question whether he was a Christian or not, um, but he critiques uh, Saturday Night Live, Seinfeld, light ni uh, late night shows. Typically, what you see in those shows, Saturday Night Live, Seinfeld, the comedy shows that are taking place late at night, where, they, where do they get their material? They're making fun of everything else in life. They're making fun of themselves. They're making fun of everything. They're punching holes in absolutely everything but they're offering up no solution, which means they're irredeemable. Now, this is a person who's critique, critique of something, and we're not even sure he's a Christian, but he's seeing what's taking place within our culture and with our society, and it causes us death. It causes us to go to place of dust. And I tell you what, I realize that cynicism, skepticism is really cool because you can kind of look back and evaluate everything else. It looks really cool. It's cool to be cynical, but I tell you what, the spirit of coolness has to die in the church in the name of Jesus. We are called not to be cynical, but thankful. And where is the origin of cynicism? It finds its way in Satan. Because Satan saw problems with everything in creation and within the creator. He saw evil in everything and even in God himself. And that spirit has pervaded the culture in which we live. And when we see evil in everything, we will begin to see evil in God. And our, our, our soul doesn't enlarge, it shrinks. Our soul begins to rot. And it's found its way in the church. C.S. Lewis says this. He's got a great quote about cynicism. Says, you cannot go on explaining away forever. You'll find that you have explained explanation itself away. You cannot go on seeing through things forever. 
The whole point of seeing through something is to see something through it. Notice, he's not saying don't be wise about something. He's not saying don't be critical about something. But the whole point of evaluation is to see more clearly the truth, the truth that will set us free. He's not saying don't evaluate stuff. He's saying meditate, be critical about something for the purpose of being able to meditate on that which is good, true, right, beautiful, and lovely. We evaluate for the purpose of seeing Jesus more clearly. So let me read that whole line again. The whole point of seeing through something is to see something through it. It is good that the window should be transparent because the street or garden beyond it is opaque. How if you saw through the garden too? It is no use trying to see through first principles if you see through everything that everything is transparent. Now listen, but a wholly transparent world is an invisible world. To see through all things is the same as not to see. It's the same as emptiness. It's the same as nothingness. It's the same as dust. And that critical spirit, that cynical spirit, has to die in the name of Jesus. Now it finds it, again, it finds its way in the church. It finds its way in the church. Because we, we evaluate, God, is your power really present with us as a community? Are you really near? Are you really personal? Do you really care about every area of my life? Do you really think about those things? Um, do, do you invest infinite thought in me? And, and we find ourselves thinking about our lives and saying, you know, this part I can see God being really attentive to. But there's other areas of my life, like I just don't feel like this thing is as important. We look at the mundane stuff of life and we think, I can see why God's attention would be towards Voice of the Martyrs or Open Doors or working in persecuted church or, or doing something great like that, but I can't see God being intimately involved in my life. So what we end up doing is taking matters into our own hands because we're cynical about God's presence, his present goodness in every area of our life. Because again, if we're not abiding with Jesus in all things, then that part of our life that we're not abiding in Jesus, that part begins to die. So if you're married and you got a spouse and, they, and one of your spouse, they just keep forgetting to take out the trash. You keep telling them, take out the trash. You get it? Take out the trash. So maybe first of all, before nagging your spouse to death, Maybe what you should do is pray. Pray for their heart to begin to change. Maybe your other, maybe, not your other spouse. <laughs> Strike that, okay. Maybe you're noticing an area within your friend or your spouse that is just a hardness. And you, and, and you find them believing different things or, or, or venturing off and doing things that you know that they shouldn't be doing. It's very easy just to clamp down and tell them all these things that they should be doing or shouldn't be doing. It's very easy to do that. In fact, that's our first response. But maybe the first response that we should engage in is kingdom-centered prayer. Begin to pray for their heart to be transformed. I know this. There was a guy that I went to seminary with who was a dear brother in the Lord, dear friend. And over the past five or ten years, he has gradually drifted from his relationship with Jesus. To the point now, he, he would say, I think I believe in God or a God, but I'm not sure. And I'll give you a confession. There's part of me that just wants to give up prayer because I've been praying for him for about, about 10 years. And there's a part of me that just wants to give up because I feel like, God, I've been praying. It doesn't seem like anything is changing. God, are you really involved in this particular situation? Or have you just scrapped it because this seems to be too difficult? Is there something that I sh should say? Maybe there is something that I should say. But the first thing that I'm called to do is to pray for him because it's only God, it's only the Spirit of God that can ultimately change the heart of a human. Now, he uses us as ambassadors. He uses us as servants, absolutely. But it's the Spirit of God that ultimately begins to bring about the change within the human heart. And we think about other things in our life. Maybe when we lose our keys, think, like, man... Where to put the keys? Our last, typically, our last thought is just to stop and just pray. Well, God doesn't care about my lost keys. And what we're saying is this, is there's a part of my life that doesn't really belong to the Lord. But these other really important things really do belong to the Lord. God belongs, he cares about every area of life. And as soon as we begin to say, he doesn't care about this, we begin to believe the lie, the cynical lie, that God isn't good and that God isn't present in every area of our life. So vacations, when you go on a vacation 
or you're considering buying a new car. So typically what we say is, does God really care about me when I buy a new car or a, you know, whether it's used or what, whatever. You guys get the idea. Think, no, God really doesn't care about whether I um, get a new house or upgrade technology or get a new car. So what we say is, I'm not going to pray about these things. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to look at my finances. I'm going to go to a car dealer or a realtor if I'm looking at a house, and I'm going I'm to figure this thing out myself. But what we've done is we've said, this part of my life really doesn't belong to God. And we become cynical about his goodness and his presence in our life. And therefore, there's a part of us that begins to die. And what I say is this, is the spirit of cynicism within the church has to die, that we are called to abide in Jesus in every area of our life. He has called us out of the dust of cynicism and into a spirit-filled life. And here's the good news. There's a great passage in Genesis chapter 18 where God comes and he visits Abraham. And some of you guys remember this story. He visits Abraham and he says, a year from now, you're going to have a son. Now, Sarah, his wife, is in the tent and she overhears the Lord speaking to Abraham about the fact that in one year, she's going to be with child. And the reason she laughs, and the reason why she laughs is because Abraham is 100 years old and she's way past childbearing. So this is an impossibility, at least from her perspective. There is no way God could pull off this miracle. There is no way. So she laughs in the tent. And the Lord says, you laughed. She goes, no, I didn't. She goes, yes, you did. (laughs) You laughed. And what the commentators will say is this, is that laugh was a laugh of skepticism and cynicism, that God really doesn't care about this, that God really isn't involved in this particular situation, that that seems to be an impossibility, at least from her perspective. But what's great is, is three chapters later in Genesis chapter 21, she in fact does give birth. She gives birth to a son who's named Isaac. And Isaac means he laughs. He laughs. And then she says, the Lord has filled me with laughter. The first laughter was a laughter of cynicism. But the second laughter is a laughter of joy, of God's presence and power with her. So it is possible to be delivered out of the dust of cynicism and into a spirit-filled life. The question for us is, is what does that look like? How is that possible? If some of you can testify, that's my biggest issue right now is I got cynicism in my heart. As I look in here, cynicism. And I want us to take note. You look at the disciples, and they were cynical all throughout Jesus' ministry for those three years. And I've often thought, man, there, there is not, not one of those disciples that I would bring on staff. Not one of them. <laughs> Not one of them. Maybe one. Maybe Judas, because he was really qualified. (laughs) I mean, he had the best resume, but besides him, I wouldn't have brought on any of those other guys. Absolutely not. But I tell you what, that we should take heart. We should take heart. Because God changed them, God transformed them through the Holy Spirit, and they went out in power. Paul says, I don't come with wise and persuasive words. I come with power. I would come with power. And that promises us for for us as a church. During this Lent season, how do we get out of cynicism, out of the dust of cynicism, and into a spirit-filled life? There's a way that we can embrace that. And the complement to that question, or the, the answer to that question, is found in Mark chapter 10. And Jesus says this, actually, Mark chapter 10, verse 13 through 16, and I'll read it. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus, you got to keep them away. They're not worthy to be with you. Your ministry is about adults. you you got to push the kids away. There was contempt in this. There was skepticism in this. There was cynicism in this. Because they're rebuking the little children. You can't come close to Jesus. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. He took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and he blessed them. He delivers out of cynicism and into a childlike faith. To inherit the kingdom of God, we've got to have a childlike faith. Now, there's a number of different characteristics. One is a child is absolutely helpless. Absolutely helpless. If you've ever seen a little child come into a conversation, they don't come with pretense. They don't come posturing. They don't come trying to figure out how do they present themselves in the midst of this conversation. No, they come just charging in. Why? Because they know that they're absolutely helpless. And Paul says it is his grace that makes us sufficient. It's only by his grace 
So when we come at God with childlike faith, we come to him completely helpless, completely helpless, recognizing that we can't control things in our own hands. We can't take matters into our own hands because it turns to dust. So we come to, ch- come to Jesus like a child, which means we come to him helpless. And second, we come to him with wonder. That's what a child does. They, they have wonder in their eyes. Have you ever seen a little child open a present? This is what happens when a child who's under three opens a present. They tear open the wrapping. They open up the box. They pull out the toy. They set the toy to the side, and they play with the box and the wrapping paper. <laughs> How does an adult open a present? They open it up and they say, that's not the right color. That's not the right size. What outfit will this go with? So immediately an adult begins to critique and be skeptical. What does a child do? He or she plays with everything. Because there's wonder in their eyes. Is there a sense of wonder in what God does? When the, when the sunrise comes up, you say, like, oh, God, thank you. Which leads to the third thing. There's a sense of joy with a child. I mean, every time you throw a child up in the air, a little kid, they come down, what do they say? Do it again. Yes, do it again. I remember when I taught my, um, uh, one of our kids how to play Uno, and uh, she figured out how to play Uno, and after we got done with the first game, what'd she say? Let's play again. After the 131st time, she said, let's play it again, because there's a sense of joy and wonder as a child. When the, again, when the sunrise comes up, do we say, God, do it again? When the sunrise goes down, do it again. Lord, you're performing great things, do it again. Joy and wonder in what God is doing. And it's great when you look at Paul and what he says. I mean, you look at his, the, 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 what he writes in the scriptures, it's always, I thank my God for all of you because of your grace. He says it in Corinthians and Ephesians, I have not stopped giving thanks to you. In Thessalonians, I pray without ceasing everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. His will for us is to be a people of gratitude, not cynicism. Calls out of cynicism and into a childlike faith. And lastly, he calls us into humility. Cynicism sits on top of a hill, looks down, and critiques everything with a heart of pride. Childlike faith gets low, gets low in humility and repentance. And by the way, God's grace always flows downhill to the humble in heart, to the one who is repentant, not to the one who's cynical, but the one who has childlike humility. There's a great story in Mark chapter 5 where you have this woman who's been bleeding, and Jesus is walking through a crowd. People are bumping up against Jesus, like thousands of people bumping up against Jesus. And there's this woman that grabs Jesus, holds on to him, touches him. He's walking through this crowd. She's been bleeding. And Jesus stops. And he says, somebody touched me. To which the disciples say, yeah, like about a thousand people have been touching you. He goes, no, somebody touched me. Somebody reached out to me in faith, the childlike faith. My power has gone out. That person got healed. I'm afraid that within the church, we have thousands of people bumping up against Jesus. But very few people reaching out to touch Jesus with a childlike faith. Childlike faith. During this Lent, we're going to be pressing into this. Out of dust and into a childlike faith. We're going to have, during this season, every Wednesday from 12 to 1, we're going to have prayer here. We also have somebody in our congregation who works downtown. If you can't make it 12 to 1, there's somebody downtown who wants to open up their office for anybody to come and pray. And if that's you, please talk to us. We'll give you that address. But we're going to come together and we're going to come out with a childlike faith and trust in God and say, Lord, do what only you can do in and through us. And listen, God's presence makes all the difference in the world. And to have a childlike faith makes all the difference in the world. I want to conclude with this. And I didn't get this. This is not original with me. It comes from Paul Miller's book, A Praying Life, which is a book I highly recommend. Um, In this book, he takes Psalm 23. And he takes out, he strikes through every reference to the good shepherd and what the good shepherd does, strikes it out. And notice what you see in here. This is without the presence of the good shepherd. My, I shall be in want. Me, me, my soul, me. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear evil, me, me. Me in the presence of my enemies. My head, my cup, me all the days of my life. Cynicism, that's cynicism. That's alone. Because when you're cynical, your world doesn't enlarge. It gets really, really small. It's only as big as you, which is nothing. You're dust. 
But notice, childlike faith trusts in the good shepherd. Notice how Psalm 23 is. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray.